Hello students, in the last class we have gone through the introduction of the Riemann integral. How the Riemann integration theory has originated and its a development. And also at the end we have gone through the definition of the partition of a closed interval. As the definition of partition is very important, therefore once again in this class we are going to revisit and revise the definition of the partition. So, definition of a partition. Partition. See here how the definition, uh, how a partition of a closed interval can be defined. Let closed interval A to B be the given closed interval. Okay. B a closed interval closed interval then by a partition of a closed in then by a partition of closed interval a to b we mean we mean a finite set, a finite set. So let that set is suppose denoted by the capital P, which is equal to the set of members x0, x1, x2, x3 and continued up to the xn such that such that this point satisfies the condition that A is equal to x0 means the first point in that set which is x0 must be equal to A then this x0 should be less than equal to x1 x1 is less than equal to x2 x2 is less than equal to x3 and continued in this manner in general we can say xi minus 1 is less than equal to xi and again continued till the last one that is the xi minus 1 okay till the last one which is the last one that is xi minus 1 it should be less than equal to the xi so this is less than equal to xi minus 1 xn minus 1 and xn minus 1 should be less than equal to xn and this xn is nothing but it must be equal to b okay so if we have a closed interval a to b then a set p of finite number of points x0 x1 x2 up to the xn satisfying the condition that a is equal to x0 which is less than equal to x1 is less than equal to x2 is less than equal to x3 and continued up to the xn minus 1 is less than equal to xn which is equal to b then such a set p is called a partition of the closed interval a to b from this definition it is clear clear that the, the partition of a interval consists of finite number of points and if we consider this p as a partition of the interval a to b then this partition consists of n plus 1 points this partition consists of n plus 1 points these n plus 1 points divides the interval a to b into n sub intervals and those sub intervals are the first sub interval is x0 to x1 this is the first sub interval second sub interval is x1 to x2 Next sub interval will be from x2 to x3 and continued in this manner we will get the nth sub interval as x n minus 1 to x n. Likewise, we will get the n minus n sub intervals of the partition P of the closed interval A to B if the partition consists of the n plus 1 points. Okay. 
a partition consists of 10 points then it will divide the interval a to b into 9 sub intervals and so on ok now let us see one or two examples of partition so for example we have a closed interval a to b suppose we have the closed interval a to b and is equal to it is, it is equal to suppose closed interval 2 to 7 any such interval can be considered as per our convenience ok so let us suppose that closed interval a to b is equal to the it is equal to closed interval 2 to 7 then let us consider some of the sets and we will check which of which one of them are partitions of interval 2 to 7 and which are not so if we consider the set let us suppose that set is p1 which consists of the points 2 next one is the 2.4 next one is the 3 next is the 3.9 next is suppose 5 and next last one is 7 this is one of the set let us suppose let us consider second set p2 which consists of the points 2 then 3 4 5 6 7 let us consider the next set suppose that set is p3 and that set consists of points 2 and 5 6.8 6.9 6.94 and 7 let us consider the some more sets for example we will consider the set p4 ok so let us consider the set p4 let p4 be the set p4 which equal to the set consisting of points 3 4 5 and 7 let us consider the set p5 next one set is suppose p5 which consists of points 2 3 5 5 6 7 ok then if we consider this we have considered we are considering these five sets of points between 2 and 7 let we will check one by one which one of them are the which one of them are partitions of closed interval a to b and which are not partitions ok let us check one by one so if we consider the set p1 then definitely all these points 2, 2.4, 3, 3.9, 5 and 7 lies between 2 and 7 and also 2 is less than equal to 2.4 actually 2 is strictly less than 2.4 2.4 is less than 3, 3 is less than 3.9 3.9 is less than 5 and 5 is less than 7 and the first one point x0 which is here equal to 2 which is equal to the a and the last one point xn which is equal to 7 it is equal to b which means that this partition p1 this set p1 is one of the partition of the closed interval 2 to 7 if we consider the set p2 then a which is equal to 2 which is equal to x0 and xn is equal to 7 which is equal to the b xn equal to 7 equal to b and 2 is less than equal to 3 is less than equal to 4 is less than equal to 5 is less than equal to 6 is less than equal to 7. So this is again a partition of interval 2 to 7. You may notice that in P in P1 partition P1 some points are fractional as some are the integer. But P2 partition P2 consists of all integral values. Let us consider the P3. P3 is equal to Suppose its first point is 2 which is equal to the left end point A. So x0 is equal to 2. x1 is equal to 5. x3 x, x1 equal to 5. x2 equal to 6.8. Then x4 equal to x3 equal to 6.9. x4 equal to 6.4. 6.94. 6 
and last one is 7. So again here a is equal to 2 which is same and b is equal to 7. So x0 is equal to 2 and xn is equal to 7 and again 2 is less than equal to 5 is less than equal to 6.8 is less than equal to 6.9 is less than equal to 6.94 is less than equal to 7 which means that p3 is also a partition of the closed interval 2 to 7. Next if we consider p4 here the left end point 2 so x, if we consider x0 equal to 3 then 3 is not equal to 2 so that x0 equal to a condition is not satisfied here so therefore no need to check whether it is a partition or not so this is not a partition of the interval 2 to say 1 as x0 is equal to 3 which is not equal to a a is a was here 3 2 so 3 is not equal to 2 so therefore p4 is not a partition of the interval 2 to 7 next if you consider the p5 then in the p5 x0 is equal to 2 which is equal to a that is equal to 2 here then x1 is equal to 3 x2 equal to 5 x4 e x3 equal to 5 x4 equal to 6 and x5 equal to 7 which is our xn that is equal to b also so 2 is less than equal to 3, 3 is less than equal to 5, 5 is equal to, equal to means it is less than equal to also 5, 5 is less than equal to 6 and 6 is less than equal to 7. Therefore, P5 satisfies all the conditions required for being a partition and therefore P5 is also a partition of the closed interval 2 to 7. Let us consider two more examples. Okay. So, Let's, next one is suppose if we consider the set P6. Let P6 be the set which consists of the points. Points of the P6 are 2. Next one point is suppose 3. Next point is suppose 6. Next is suppose 4. Next one is suppose 5. And last one is suppose 7. Now, if you consider here, and one more example we will consider P7. Let us P7 as the points 2 and 7 only. Okay. Now let us see first of all about the P6 whether it is a partition or not. So if you consider P6 then left end point X0 is equal to 2 that is equal to A. And right end point Xn which is equal to 7 is equal to B. Again 2 is less and 2, 3, 6, 4, 5, 7 all, are all values which lies between 2 and 7. So all these conditions are satisfied. But P6 is not a partition. Why it is not a partition? Because if, if you observe that, that this 6 is not less than or equal to 4. Okay. Even if 2 is less than or equal to 3 and 3 is less than or equal to 6, but 6 is not less than or equal to 4. Therefore, one condition fails here to hold. Therefore, P6 is not a partition of the interval 2 to 7. Let us see the P7. In the P7, x0 is equal to 2 which is equal to A. And xn is equal to 7 which is equal to B. And obviously, 2 is less than or equal to 7. Therefore, P7 is a partition of the interval 2 to 7. So, out of this 7, P1, P2 up to P7, only P1, P2, P3, P5 and P7 are the partitions of the interval 2 to 7, whereas P4 and P6 are not partitions of the interval 2 to 7. Okay, clear this definition of the partition. Now, if you consider the partition P1, then in the partition P1, it consists of the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 6 points. 6 points means therefore for the P1, n is equal to 5. Okay, partition P consists of n plus 1 points. So here n plus 1 is equal to 6, therefore n is equal to 5 for the partition P1. Again, for the partition P2, if we consider the values, or the points in that part in the set P2, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Here also n is equal to 5. Next one, if you consider the partition P3, then 1, 2, 3, 
four, five, six. Here also, coincidentally, the number of points are six. Therefore, n is equal to five. As p four is not a partition, therefore, we will not go for the n. If you consider the p five, one, two, three, four, five, six. Here also, n is equal to five. It doesn't mean that always n is equal to five, which can be which is clear from the p seven. P seven consists of only two points. So for the P seven, n is equal to one only. Okay, partition P consists of n plus one points. Therefore, n in this case may be any positive integer, varying from any positive integer one, two, three, four, five, six hundred thousand any log number it can be. Okay, so from this. The definition of the partition is very clear. Next one. Now we'll move to the. After this, we'll move to the next one as the definitions of Darboux sums. Okay. But before going to the definitions of Darboux sums, one more thing that we have discussed yesterday. I'm going to tell that 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 thing is the the notation delta x i. Okay. We use the notation delta x i with two different meanings, which are the two different meanings of the mean of the de notation delta x i. So the notation delta x i is used to denote the notation delta x i. We are going to use to denote two different things. First one, delta x i denotes the ith subinterval. I can be any integer from one to n. So delta x i denotes the ith subinterval. Ith subinterval will be the x i minus one to x i. Okay, ith subinterval x i minus one to x i. Obviously, where where i is equal to one, two, three, and continued up to the n, which means that in this one, if we put For example, i equal to one, then we'll get delta x one. Okay, if you put i equal to one, we'll get the delta x one. And what is delta x one? So delta x one, this one delta x one will be equal to put i equal to one. So if you put i equal to one here, then we'll get delta x one equal to x one minus one means x zero two. Closed interval x zero to i equal to one means x one. So this is the closed interval x zero to x one will be denoted by the notation delta x one. Now if you put i equal to two in this one formula, then we'll get delta x two. So delta x two will be equal to. If you put i equal to two, we'll get x two minus one means x one. So closed interval x one to x two. And so on. Lastly, if you put i equal to the last value n, then we will get the delta x n, and delta x n will be equal to the x n minus one to x n. This closed interval, x n minus one to x n. This closed interval will get as the delta x n. Okay. So one meaning of the this delta x i is the ith subinterval. And this delta x i is also used to denote the length of the subinterval. So the other meaning of the delta x i is what length of the ith subinterval. Length of the ith subinterval means that I am doing, I am indicating by the other color pane. Okay. So delta x i is also used. This notation is also used to denote length. Of the ith subinterval, ith subinterval. Length of the ith subinterval means means that is that is ith subinterval was x i minus one to x i. So its length will be the right end point minus length minus left end point. So therefore, we'll get delta x i. Will be equal to right end point of the ith subinterval is the x i minus left end point of the ith subinterval is the x i minus one. 
So this difference xi minus xi minus 1 is also denoted by the notation delta xi. Okay. So these are the two meanings of the two meanings of the that notation delta xi. One meaning is the ith sub interval and the other meaning is the length of the ith sub interval. Then similarly if you consider the delta x1 then delta x1 will be equal to if you consider the length as a length okay if it is considered as a length then delta x1 will be clearly equal to length of the first sub interval and length of the first interval sub interval will be the x1 minus x0 if you consider the length of the second sub interval it will be denoted by the delta x2 and which will be equal to the x2 minus x1 similarly and continuing in this manner if you consider the length of the nth sub interval then it will be denoted by the delta xn and it will be equal to the xn minus xn minus 1 okay so here i am going to clear one thing important thing that you have to remember that in mathematics notations plays a very important role so you have to use the proper notations otherwise its the meaning will be totally changed how it how it works see here here it is x n minus 1 x n minus 1 means x n minus 1 complete n minus 1 in the suffix okay instead of that if you write x n minus 1 then this is a totally different thing from this xn minus 1. Okay, this is xn minus 1 and this is xn minus 1. So these are the two different things. Therefore, you have to pay in sufficient intention about the notations that we are going to use. So this is about the i sub interval, its length as well as the i sub interval that we both things we denote by the delta x r after this the next one is obviously we are going to consider the two important definitions one is about the one definition we will consider about the upper darbox sum and second the lower darbox sum okay so both we will consider here upper darbox sum and lower darbox sum both sums we are going to consider here so to begin with is the upper darbox sum okay upper darbox sum both are these are darbox sums as the mathematician darbox has first of all given these sums introduced these sums therefore the name is given after him as the darbox sums and these are the two darbox sums they can be simply called as the sums also instead of calling the darbox sums they are also called as the sums okay so which are those so see here for that purpose let we are going to consider the darbox sums now okay darbox sums darbox sums there are two darbox sums, upper darbox sum and lower darbox sum. But for both the darbox sums, we are going to suppose something here in the beginning. What is it? C R. So let let f be a function. Let f be a function. Obviously, it is real valued function on closed interval a to b. Okay, let f be a real valued function defined on defined on closed interval a to b defined on closed interval a to b and let us suppose that it is bounded and f is bounded. Okay, it is bounded function f is bounded then as f is bounded therefore on the interval a to b therefore it is bounded on each sub interval of the of the interval a to b okay then 
then clearly f is bounded then clearly f is bounded also on each sub interval each sub interval x i minus 1 x i minus 1 to x i of closed interval a to b and these sub intervals are formed by the sum 1 partition of the interval a to b ok so as f is bounded on the complete closed interval a to b therefore clearly f will be bounded on each sub interval x i minus 1 to x i where i varies from 1 to n it is obvious ok so as f is bounded on the interval x i minus 1 to x i this x i minus 1 to x i we can denote by the delta x i also ok x i minus 1 to x i this one as told just now just 2 4 minutes before it will be denoted by the interval delta x i so so as f is bounded on the delta x i that is x i minus 1 to x i closed interval therefore let us suppose that its infimum and supremum means bounds exist ok so let let capital M i ok let capital M i be the let capital M i be the supremum let capital M i be the supremum what is mean by supremum by the supremum we mean list upper bound list upper bound ok in short we call it as a that is L U B ok hereafter, hereafter most of the times we are going to use the L U B this short form for the list upper bound so let capital M I be the supremum that is the L U B means list upper bound of F of function F in in ith sub interval in ith sub interval in ith sub interval delta x i ok in ith sub interval delta x i what is mean by the supremum that you have studied in the first year already ok as well as in the second year third semester we have dealt with the supremum infimum of sets and so on ok so let capital M I be the supremum of function F in the ith sub interval delta x i. Roughly speaking, we can say supremum of function F in the sub delta x i sub interval, which means that the largest value of function F in the ith sub interval is capital M I. Largest value of function F. Okay, largest value of function F in the ith sub interval that we are denoting by the capital M I. So then, then the upper door box sum, then the upper door box sum, okay, then the upper door box, then the upper door box sum upper dark box sum which we are going to denote by the notation u p f here p is capital as it is for the set partition p u is also capital it is for the upper sum so then the upper dark box sum u p f is is defined as is defined as how it is defined as then the upper door box sum u p of is defined as it is defined by the equation and the equation is which is the equation the equation is u p of upper door box sum u p of u p of this upper door box sum it is equal to it is equal to the summation 
over i equal to 1 to n. Okay, summation over i equal to 1 to n. Capital Mi means the supremum that is LUB. Okay, into delta Xi. Summation over i equal to 1 to n. Capital Mi into delta Xi. This is the definition of the upper Darboux sum. The same thing is nothing but this is equal to mean this in this one if you put i equal to 1 to n then it will get the first term if you put i equal to 1 we will get capital m1 into delta x1 if you put i equal to 2 we will get capital m2 into delta x2 if you put i equal to 3 we will get capital m3 into delta x3 and continued in this manner if you put i equal to n then we will get capital m n we will get capital m n into delta x n ok capital m n into delta x n into delta x n ok now in this one m1 is the supremum of the function f in the first subinterval into this delta x1 is for the length of the first subinterval and length of the first subinterval is the x1 minus x0 plus m2 is the supremum of the function f in the second subinterval and into length of the second subinterval delta that is delta x2 which is nothing but x2 minus x1 plus the third term is m3 which is the supremum of the second sub interval uh, supremum of the function f in the third sub interval into length of the third sub interval that is length of delta x3 which is again denoted by the delta x3 which is x3 minus x2 and continued up to the supremum of the function f in the nth sub interval into length of the nth sub interval which is xn minus xn minus 1. Okay. So, for understanding purpose, the same thing I am going to write in other, in simplified form also. Okay. So, what is this? This is nothing but this is equal to m1 means supremum of the function f in the first sub interval into length of the first sub interval. Length of the first sub interval is x1 minus x0 plus m2 means supremum of the function f in the second sub interval into length of the second sub interval which is x2 minus x1 and continued in this manner the last one is supremum of the function f in the nth sub interval that is mn into length of the last sub interval that is xn minus x n minus 1 ok so likewise we have the Likewise, we have this one, the definition of the upper Darboux sum. Upper Darboux sum, many times we call it as simply upper sum. Okay. Let us see once again the definition of the upper Darboux sum. How we have defined upper Darboux sum. See, here. let f be a function. Let f be a function. Obviously, let f be a real valued function. Real valued means whose value for whatever are the values of x it's a value means it's a result we are going to a real number so it is called as a real valued function so let f be a real valued function which is bounded and it is defined on the interval a to b defined on interval a to b means interval closed interval a to b is its a domain okay let f be a real valued bounded function defined on the closed interval a to b then f is bounded also on each sub interval xi minus 1 to xi of the closed interval a to b. Okay. Let capital MI be the supremum that is LUB of function f in the ith sub interval delta xi. Then the upper Darboux sum which we, which we are going to denote by the notation UPF is defined as okay, it is defined by the equation. It is defined by the equation up of equal to summation over i equal to 1 to n capital mi into delta xi. 
which is nothing but that is equal to if you put i equal to 1 to n then it is equal to capital m1 into delta x1 here delta x1 is is for the length of the first sub interval plus capital m2 means supremum of the function f in the second sub interval into length of the second sub interval which we denote by the notation delta x2 plus continued up to the plus last term is capital mn into delta xn so this is the definition of the upper darbox sum okay so upper darbox sum definition is this after this definition of upper darbox sum we will consider the definition of the lower darbox sum which can be simply called as the lower sum also okay so lower darbox sum or lower sum in the definitions of upper and lower darbox sums there is minor change okay in place of the supremum means the lub we are going to consider the infimum that is the glb of function f in corresponding sub intervals and we will get the lower darbox sum okay so lower darbox sum lower dar box sum also simply called as a lower sum okay so lower dar box sum see how it is defined let f b a bounded let f b a bounded real valued function bounded real valued function defined on okay defined on closed interval a to b defined on closed interval a to b then f is bounded then f is bounded also then f is bounded also on each sub interval each sub interval delta xi each sub interval delta xi of closed interval a to b okay next let small mi we are going to use the capital mi to denote the supremum and small mi to denote the infimum of function f okay let small mi be the infimum Small m i be the infimum of function f. Infimum of function f in ith sub interval. In ith sub interval delta x i. Ith sub interval delta x i. Okay. So infimum means what is meant by the infimum? By the infimum, we mean it is the greatest lower bound, greatest lower bound. In short, it is called as a GLB, greatest lower bound. It is the greatest among all the lower bounds of the function f. Okay, so. The let small mi be the infimum that is glb of function f in the ith sub interval okay then then the lower then the lower dar box sum then the lower dar box sum which we are going to denote by the l p f this l is for to denote lower sum p is to denote the over partition p and f is to denote the of the function f we, we read this as the in short we are reading this as the l p f but actually it should it is should be written it should be read as lower dar box sum over partition p of the function f lower dar box sum of over partition p of the function f okay then the lower dar box sum that is lpf is is defined is defined as is defined as or is given by so it is given by the formula and formula for the lower dar box sum what is the formula for the lower dar box sum 
that I am writing here. It is the LPF. L capital P F lower dar buxom or partition P of function F. It is equal to summation over I equal to 1 to N small MI into delta XI. Okay, if you observe, there is only one difference between the formula for the upper and lower dar buxom and the change is that in the upper dar buxom we have considered. In the upper dark box sum, we have considered the we have considered the LUP that is supremum at here that is capital MI and in the lower dark box sum we are considering the GLB that is the infim that in GLB means the infimum of function f in the ith sub interval. Okay, and obviously which is nothing but this will be equal to this will be equal to Put i equal to 1 to n in this formula. So we'll get m1 small m1 into delta x1 plus small m2 into delta x2 and plus continued up to the small mn into delta xn. Okay. Again, delta x1 is nothing but it is the length of the first sub interval. And therefore, length of the first sub interval is nothing but that is known to us. It is length of the first sub interval is nothing but it is the x1 minus x0. So, therefore, this can also be written as this is nothing but m1 small m1 means infimum of the function f in the first sub interval into delta x1 means x1 minus x0 plus m2 small m2 into delta x2 means means it is x2 minus x1 and plus plus so on continued up to the last one and up to the last one and last one is nothing but it is mn okay mn mn means length of the nth sub interval into delta xn means xn minus x n minus 1 okay likewise we have the formula for and the definition of lower dark box sum or partition p of the function f okay so we have seen both lower dark box sum and upper dark box sum both we have seen today so we'll stop here and we'll continue in the next class thank you